want to invite you to take your Bible and find the Gospel of John. We're looking in the last several verses of John's Gospel. So if you'll be finding John chapter 21, we'll begin in a moment in verse 15. If you brought a Bible or if you use a Bible out of the book rack or your favorite Bible app on your smart device, we're all finding together the Gospel of John chapter 21. We've made our way up to the final lesson in our Sunday morning study, sometimes interrupted as we've been walking our way verse by verse through this fourth gospel written under divine inspiration by the Apostle John. I preached it under the title, I Believe, because John wants us to understand, to know and believe the right things about Jesus Christ. In fact, the theme verse of this gospel is found in chapter 20 and verse 31. For John says, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. In our final lesson in this book, John shows us how to finish a book, how to finish a chapter, and how to finish a life with grace. And so from John 21, from verse 15 through 25, I want to speak today on the subject, finish well. Finish well. Well, John 21, beginning in verse 15, if you're able and willing to do so, let me ask you to stand to honor the reading of the word of God. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this, he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. This is the one who also had leaned back on Jesus' bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Father in heaven, bless the reading of your word. May this assembly see Christ, the Son of God. And seeing him, may they believe. And believing, may they embrace and express gratitude for or perhaps receive for the very first time your gracious free gift of eternal life. For the glory of Jesus, I ask it. Amen. Before we dissect these words of Jesus to Simon Peter, I simply want to point out that Simon Peter is in fact the one to whom Jesus is speaking. Jesus is giving some instructions that will recommission, reinstate, and restore Simon Peter to his apostolic work. Simon Peter had failed the Lord. He had fallen. He, like the rest of us, had fallen short of the glory of God. I want you to understand that when I talk about finishing well, I understand that there are some that though they may have started well and desire to finish well, right now you're not continuing well. 
Now, it is always too late for us to go back and change the failures of yesterday, but it is never too late for us to draw a line in the sand and say from this day forward, from this moment forward, from this very second forward, I am going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with all that I am and all that I have. I may not be doing so well right now, but by the grace of God, I aim to finish well. Jesus is talking to Simon Peter. I'm talking about, they may all leave you, but I never will, Simon Peter. I'm talking about, took out his sword and cut off the the, the soldier's ear, Simon Peter. If you know the story, I'm talking about, turn like a traitor and cuss like a sailor, Simon Peter. I'm talking about, ran like a girl and cried like a baby, Simon Peter. Jesus says to him, Simon, I'm not finished with you. Simon, I've got a great work in store for you. And Jesus, in his mercy and grace, restores Simon Peter to his work. Dr. John MacArthur comments on this simple truth and writes that the other disciples needed to hear Peter's affirmation of his love for Christ and Christ's recommissioning of him so that they would be willing to loyally support his leadership. Now, not many days from this encounter by the Sea of Galilee, Simon will be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He will preach the great Pentecost sermon. And within just a few days of this encounter with Jesus, Simon Peter will be the head of this new work called the Church of Jesus Christ, the earthly head, if you please. And he will be the pastor of what today we would call a mega church. And if you were to ask him, Simon Peter, how did you go from being a backslidden fisherman on the Sea of Tiberias to being the great preacher of Pentecost? He would say, it's simply because I was restored by a sin-forgiving, transgression-removing Savior who died on the cross and rose from the dead and placed me in his service. I was called by God, not just of second chances. I got my second chance and blew it a long time ago. I was called to serve by God of another chance. And Simon Peter gives us some instruction along with Jesus and John about how to finish well. Now before we begin taking notes, let me just say to you that I need you to pray for me this morning. I'm struggling with a sinus infection and a sore throat. the, The kind of stuff that sets on us at this time of year. I feel like my head is in a drum. That usually causes me to preach in a little more laid back, sedate state. And when I do that, most Almost invariably, somebody comes up, Brother Mike, is something bothering you? Yeah, my sinuses. <laughs> that's all that's bothering me this morning. Let's look in this passage and see how we can finish well for Jesus. Number one, if we're going to finish well, we've got to finish by living a life of service. Two pastors were talking one day, and one asked the other, How many active members do you have? He said, All of them. He said, all of them. He said, yes, some are actively building and others are actively destroying. He said, oh, you misunderstood. I mean, how many are serving? And the pastor said, oh, I understood you well. All of them are serving. Some are serving Christ and others are serving themselves. Many are old enough to remember when the songwriting crooner Bob Dylan said, you got to serve somebody. God has wired us so that we must and we indeed will serve somebody. To finish well, we must live a life of service. Now I draw this principle from verses 15 through 17 where three different times Jesus asks Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, or Simon Barjona, Simon, do you love me? And the first of those three times, Jesus actually said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, scholars are divided as to what these is referencing. Picture Jesus at that fish breakfast by the Sea of Galilee, and he, 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 he gestures with his hand. He, he waves and points towards something. Simon, do you love me more than these? The question we need to ask is more than what? What was Jesus talking about? What was he pointing to when he asked, do you love me more than these? There are actually two schools of thought. And I'm going to do something 
that's unusual for me. That is, I'm going to present some preaching and application points based on both of these schools of thought. Now, only one of them could be the thing that Jesus was referencing, but I believe that, that both ideas have biblical truth behind them. Some, for example, say that when Jesus said, Do you love me more than these? He was waving his hand perhaps toward the other apostles that had joined them for breakfast that day. You remember there were seven apostles that had left their apostolic work and gone back to the life of fishing. Perhaps Jesus was looking at Simon and pointing to the other six. Do you love me more than they love me? Others say, No, Jesus was pointing to The paraphernalia and equipment from that fishing trip. Do you love me more than the boat and the the net and in our day the fishing poles and the trot lines? Do Do you love me more than these? Well, Let's think about that first possible interpretation. Simon, do you love me more than these other apostles? And Simon would say, if you're going to live a life of service, you've got to be careful. And don't be disqualified by your pride. Don't be disqualified by your pride. Why would Jesus have referenced these other apostles if indeed that's what he is doing? Well, I'll remind you, it hadn't been many days before this that Simon Peter very boastfully said, They may all leave you, but I never will. Simon, now that you've been to the school of hard knocks... Simon, do you remember that thing with the sword? Simon, do you remember saying that you did not know me? Simon, do you remember swearing and cursing to try to prove that you did not even know who I was? Simon, are you still full of yourself? Simon, do you still think you love me more than anyone else? Simon, do you still think you're above failure? Simon, are you still riding to breakfast on your high horse? Or, Simon, do you now realize you're cut out of the same cloth that everybody else is cut out of? Simon, do you still think you love me more than these? Perhaps to the prideful Christian in this section, if I were just to illustrate, do you really think that you love the Lord Jesus more than anybody else on this side of the room? Do Do you really love me more than these? Simon Peter obviously learned this lesson very well. He would later write in 1 Peter 5, verse 5, And all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. There in 1 Peter 5, Simon is quoting from Proverbs chapter 3. Where one translation in verse 34 says that God has no use for conceited people but shows favor to those who are humble. Simon, do you still think you're all that in a bag of chips? Simon, you still think you got a bunch going for you in and of yourself? Simon, do you love me more than these? There's some indication that this might be the answer in, in the language that Jesus uses in these three questions. Now, in our English translation, it seems as if Jesus just repeats it. Simon, do you love me? But in the Greek language of the New Testament, and I'm not going to bore you by digging down too deeply into it, but but actually, Jesus and Simon are using two different words. When Jesus first poses the question, he uses the word agape. Now, Bible students know that is a word that speaks of unconditional love, boundless love, love without limit, love without restriction, love without caveat. Simon, do you love me supremely more than anyone or anything else? Simon, do you agape me? And Simon Peter actually did not answer his question. Because Simon said, Lord, I phileo you. Phileo is a Greek word that gives us the idea of brotherly love. The city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And so the first time Jesus says, Simon, do you agape me? Simon said, you know I phileo you. Jesus sort of says, that's not what I asked. I want to, Simon, do you agape me? Lord, you know I phileo you. We do no injustice to the text to say, Simon, I want to know, do you love me so much that you'll give me everything you have and all that you are? And Simon says, Lord, you know good and well I think you're a great guy. The third time, Jesus used Simon's word. Simon, 
Do you phileo me? Friend, in that language, Jesus is picturing the truth of the gospel. Simon, you need to understand this lesson. In and of yourself, you will never be able to come up to where I am. You will never be able to do everything that I have called you to do. But in love and grace and mercy, Simon, I am willing to come down to where you are. I will take you where you're at and I will use you for my glory. Again in 1 Peter chapter 5, now in verse 6, Simon, having learned this lesson, says, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. I believe Simon Peter, reinstated, would say to us, there are, there are no people who are too little for God to use, but some people are just too big. Too big for their britches. Don't be disqualified. By your pride. But I tell you there are two schools of thought. To, do, do you love me more than these? <laughs> Some say it referenced the apostles. Others say no it was the fishing paraphernalia. And that interpretation would remind us of another equally true biblical principle. That is don't be distracted by your pastimes. No less than John MacArthur is convinced that when Jesus said, Do you love me more than these? He was waving his hand toward all of the boats and the nets and indeed even the fish. I'll remind you from our last study, Simon and the other apostles were to be waiting on Christ Jesus at a mountainside in Galilee. But when Christ comes, they have gone fishing. In this interpretation, Jesus says, Simon, do you really promise to serve me faithfully or you just want to fish? Nothing wrong with fishing, amen? Unless fishing keeps you from serving Jesus. Simon, do you really aim to serve me? Or are you going to be too busy making money to serve me? Simon, do you really want to give your life in total submission to my holy will? Or are you going to spend all of your tomorrows doing the things that you want to do? Simon, do you love me more than these? I wonder if Christ were here in bodily form sitting next to you on the pew and said, do do you really love me more than that? What would he be pointing toward? A bass boat? An RV? A house? A deer stand? A sail paper? A family member? A gold watch? Do you love me more than that? Simon, don't be distracted by your pastimes. We all know that Jesus said you can't serve God and money. That's actually part of a larger teaching where Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters. You will hate one and love the other, or you will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. In other words, when Jesus said you can't serve God and money, that was an illustration of the greater principle that you can't serve God and have any other God you're trying to serve in your life. This truth was illustrated to me probably a decade ago. A pastor friend of mine who serves in the Atlanta area, I call him at least once a week. And this particular Monday I called him and I noticed on the weather channel that they had bad weather move through their town through the weekend. So I said, how were services yesterday? He said, they were great. I said, I guess attendance was off a little bit. I saw the storms moving through your area. He said, oh no, attendance was actually up. I said, up, do tell. How does a Baptist preacher pull that off in bad weather? He said, well, it was predicted to be bad, but it turned out to not be that bad. But it was bad enough weather that on Saturday night, everybody up here canceled their trip to the Braves game, canceled their trip to Lake Lanier, canceled their trip to Stone Mountain, canceled their trip to Atlanta Motor Speedway, Canceled their trip to the Coca-Cola Museum. Canceled their trip up to LJ to buy apples because everybody knows if you live near Atlanta, Sunday morning is the only time that you can drive up to LJ and buy some apples. He said, it seems as if they said, since the weather is so bad, we can't do anything else. We might as well just go to church. I don't have to remind you we live in a culture where the church of the risen Christ is forced to plan its schedule around travel ball and little league. 
We spend more time in the woods than in the Word. Ouch. Our children memorize more about the characters on their favorite TV show or video game or Facebook app than they hide the Word of God in their hearts. Now on this point, I'm going to get in your business in just a few moments, or rather I pray the Lord will. So let me give you a good working uh, uh, list of how you will know whether or not you're distracted by pastime or indeed are serving another God. Now this won't be on the screen, but this is good teaching right here. You ought to jot these down. Number one, you get excited when your God is discussed. When your God is the subject of discussion, you get excited about it. You say, I'm not real talkative. Yes, you are. We're just apparently not talking about your God. But if we get to talking about the thing that's your God, you'll come alive like at a Benny Hinn crusade. You get excited when your God is discussed. You get bothered when your God is threatened. And you get offended when your God is criticized. God may be asking someone in the building this morning, do you love me? More than these. Simon, I want you to live a life of service. I want you to finish well. That requires not only living a life of service, but now in verses 18 through 19, finish well by living a life of sacrifice. No sooner does Jesus take off his chef's hat from having fixed that fish breakfast, does he put on his prophet's robe and says, Simon, I want to talk to you about something. What is it, Lord? I want to talk to you about your death. Now, like a good obituary or a funeral sermon, when you read it, it ought to not only tell you some things about the death of the person that died, but listen, friend, when you read it, it ought to cause the living to reevaluate things about their own life. And in verses 18 and 19, Jesus speaks, and then John comments about this little prophecy of his death. And in that simple statement, I want you to notice, first of all, the mode of, of sacrifice. Verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. Now, Jesus is not promoting or condoning the rebellion of a child, just doing whatever they want to. He's talking about their physical abilities. It has been said that you spend the first two years of your child's life trying to get them to talk and walk, and then the next 16 years trying to get them to sit down and be quiet. Jesus is referencing physical ability. When you're younger, you can kind of go and do the things that you like to do. But when you get older, you're dependent upon other people. Some of you even perhaps need your children or a neighbor or a friend to drive you around, especially at night. And Jesus draws from that principle in verse 18. When you were younger, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands And someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this would be a somewhat mysterious statement, but for the commentary the Holy Spirit gives in verse 19. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. In other words, when I say that somebody is going to stretch out your hands and gird you and take you somewhere that you don't want to go, Simon, I'm telling you, You're going to live a little while longer, and when you get old, you're going to die by means of crucifixion. Someone will stretch out your hands and take your life. Early church history is unanimous that Peter was crucified under the regime of Emperor Nero, probably between 30 and 35 years after this fish breakfast by the Sea of Galilee. Now the idea that many of you have heard that Simon Peter was crucified upside down is not based on a lot of actual history, more of of an old wives' tale. We cannot be certain about that, but what we do know is Jesus Christ told Simon Peter, you're going to die by crucifixion. And while the Lord has not called us to give up our life by being impaled on a cruel Roman cross, the reality is every child of God has been called to the crucified life. A few months ago, we memorized Galatians 2, verse 20, and it begins, I have been crucified with Christ. For us, the cross is not a place of literal death, but it is at the very least a place of spiritual death. To die to ourself, our motive, our idea, our agenda, our purposes, we die to that and we are resurrected to the purposes of Jesus Christ. I stand here today to say, away. 
away with this sanitized version of American Christianity which lets you embrace the life of Jesus while hanging on to your own life. Jesus very famously said in Luke 9, 23, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It's hard to talk to an American church about the issue of sacrifice and persecution. We think sacrifice is when we're asked to change Sunday school classes or work in the nursery. Now that's service, but that's not sacrifice. You're saying, preacher, you don't have to keep the kids that I have to keep when I work in the nursery. It's martyrdom and persecution, the ones I've got to keep. I mean, really, we think that Christian persecution is when our favorite retailer says happy holidays, happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. Now, I wish they would honor the birth of our Lord, but that's a far cry from the sacrifice and the persecution that our brothers and sisters are facing in many places in the world. Our friend Terry Trivett stated the issue like this. Preaching on this very verse, he said, If the prophecy of Peter's death sounds a little too extreme for you, then perhaps the Christ that uttered that prophecy is a little too extreme to be your Lord. Have you sacrificed anything for Jesus lately? To finish well, you have to live a life of sacrifice that at least in the spiritual realm looks a whole lot like somebody nailing you to a condemned criminal's cross. The mode of sacrifice. Let me say a word also about the motive for sacrifice. Jesus makes it very clear. Simon is going to die by crucifixion. And then the Holy Ghost adds this epitaph. Verse 19. Now this Jesus said signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. The motive is that God would be glorified through every sacrifice that I make. That God was glorified through the sacrifice of Peter's life. And that God should be glorified when I sacrifice things as well. What I'm trying to say, beloved, is that we glorify God even when our gift is costly. I say especially when our gift is costly. That is when I come to the offering plate, for example. God, I'm not only giving this gift... But God, I'm declaring you are worthy of me doing without the stuff I would have bought with that money if I had not made it a gift to you. God, you're not only worthy of me coming in the sunshine when the weather's great and the atmosphere is warm. God, you're worthy of me fighting the the rain and, and, and in the summertime the heat. God, you're worthy of me inconveniencing myself for you. Remember the story of the missionary in the Amazon who won a native to Christ. And the native returned to his home, which was six hours by foot, walking along the banks of the Amazon and up through the jungle and over the hills, six hours one way. So the missionary was surprised days later when there was a knock at the door, and it was the new convert carrying a bag of fruit. And he said, I want to bring this to the man who told me about Jesus. I brought it from my house. He said, from your house, that's a, that's a, that's a 12-hour walk, round trip. You, you didn't have to walk that far to bring me a basket of fruit. And the new convert said, long walk, part of gift. May I ask you today, have you taken any long walks for Jesus lately? Have you inconvenienced yourself for the cause of Christ? To what extent, if any, are you suffering for the namesake of the risen Jesus? I did not ask you, are you suffering? Because we all suffer. But arthritis is not necessarily suffering for the cause of Christ. A job loss is not necessarily martyrdom as a follower of Jesus. I mean, can you tie anything in your life to the fact that you're even inconvenienced, much less suffering? For the cause of Christ. Personally I am convicted. By the fact I often give to my Savior lesser things. And leftovers. Now are y'all just going to leave me up here in this sermon by myself? This principle was graphically illustrated by a prominent preacher a few years ago. And I have baptized it and adapted this illustration 
to be my own. I want you to imagine a traveler that comes from another world, indeed an extraterrestrial guest, who knows nothing of our customs, nothing of our norms, nothing of our ways. He visits you and your family on an ordinary average weekend in the fall. It's Friday night. Mid-afternoon, he sees the first of thousands of people gathering at a local arena. It's obvious that this is an important event because the event doesn't start until 7.30 and by 2.30 people are already arriving. There's green grass and white stripes and a logo in the middle of the field that's the same emblem that's on the caps and the jackets and the t-shirts. Now when this bizarre event begins, the arena is filled with people. Some have traveled from nearby. Hundreds, even thousands, have traveled many, many hours to be there. They scream until they can't talk anymore. This event goes into what they call overtime, and they all seem to be excited that they're not going to get to go home as soon as they thought they were. They're texting and tweeting and Facebooking and Instagramming all the news from this awesome event to satisfy the Broken hearts of those who wanted to be there but could not attend. When it's over, there's shouting by those who got what they wanted to see. There's weeping by those who did not get what they desired. It's Saturday morning. Our extraterrestrial friend hears the alarm clock go off at 4.30. As his host rises from the bed for a quick cup of coffee, not Too much coffee now because an unexpected trip to the bathroom might be a distraction to what he's trying to accomplish. Did y'all catch that? He clothes himself in four layers of clothing. The last one looks like a cross between a pine forest and an oak grove. He sprays himself down with a mysterious spray and coats the soles of his shoes with the liquid waste of a forest animal. Getting in his truck, he drives 45 minutes to a dark forest and climbs up a pine tree under cover of darkness. Again, he's arriving early because he doesn't want to miss a single thing. He sits there for hours as icicles form on his multicolored ski mask and he is constantly interacting with his surroundings. He's on the edge of his seat. The slightest noise. The snapping of a twig. The rustling of a leaf. And he is as engaged as anyone could possibly be. He sees nothing. After the four hours up the tree, he climbs down the tree. But our mysterious guest knows this has to be an awesome event because the host calls a buddy and says, didn't see anything, we'll try it again Monday morning early before work. It's now Sunday morning. Our strange visitor hears the alarm clock sound at 8 a.m. Three cups of coffee and a quick shower and later the whole crew heads out the door. Our guest realizes that whatever we're going to today must not be nearly as important as Friday night or Saturday morning because we're already ten minutes late and the family seems unbothered by the tardiness. Whatever's happening at the kickoff of this Sunday morning event is apparently of little to no significance. They're invited to sing and to clap, but many do not. And our strange friend already knows this is not as important as what happened earlier this weekend. After the singing and the clapping and even a little bit of shouting, some man, a good-looking guy no doubt, gets up to speak. In his monologue, the speaker occasionally requests an amen, but rarely gets one. E.T. begins to wonder, maybe we can get some of those pretty girls in the short skirts from that Friday night thing to come to to this place and say, we got an amen, yes we do, we got an amen, how about you? (laughs) But our tourist digresses. (laughs) At the end of the speech, one person seems to respond to the talk. Few people seem very excited about the one that did respond and fewer still seem bothered that more did not respond. This event is going into overtime too. 
three minutes. But what's strange is that the host is offering an embarrassed apology for keeping the people longer than they thought they were going to be there. And when it finally, finally ends, the hallways immediately fill with people discussing the events from Friday night and Saturday morning. Now if this scene ever actually unfolded, and I'm not even slightly suggesting that it does, Which event would our extraterrestrial friend think was more important to us? Which would he think we were giving our life to serve and sacrifice? Friend, if we're going to finish well, we've got to live a life of service. We've got to live a life of sacrifice. And lastly, we've got to live a life of submission. After telling Simon Peter about his death, Jesus repeats a two-word mandate that first called Simon Peter to be a disciple. Follow me. Now I really do believe that Simon Peter aims to live the rest of his life following Jesus. But he is immediately met by one of the most common demonic distractions that face the people who want to be Christ's followers. And we find it in our closing verses. I want you to notice first we've got to have a singular focus on Jesus. Now the narrative portion of John's gospel has come to an end and then we have this rather strange exchange. Jesus has just told Simon Peter, follow me. And listen, look, that's what Simon begins to do. And then he looks over his shoulder as he's walking with Jesus and sees somebody else following Jesus too. We know, of course, it's the apostle John himself. And Simon turns to Jesus and says, um, Lord, what about him? He's now distracted by another Christ follower. What about him, Lord? Remember, Simon had just been told, you're going to die a martyr's death. What about him, Lord? Does he have to die too? And so Jesus says, if I let him live until I return, what's that to you? Now the language of the New Testament is actually sharp, it's caustic and somewhat abrasive. We would render the text in our South Georgia vernacular like this, what I do with my other servant is none of your business. You follow me. If I want to bless him in a way that I'm not blessing you, that's none of your business. If I want to exalt him in a way that you're not going to be exalted, that's none of your business. Your job is to follow me. If I want to give her a bigger Sunday school class than the one I give to you, that's none of your business. You follow me. If they start letting their kids dress like a bunch of immodest hussies, that's none of your business. You follow me. If they start laying out of church and growing lukewarm about the things of God, that's got nothing to do with your commitment to me. Get your eyes off of them, Simon. You follow me. In this church years ago, I had to approach a Sunday school teacher that was no longer going to 5 o'clock teachers meetings and didn't seem to be a lot of reason why. The answer they gave me was, well, there are a whole bunch of people that don't go. I said, I referenced this passage. I said, what's that got to do with you? By the way, I may be on to their house next. What's that got to do with you? They made the same promise. I'm the same commitment that you do. The fact that they're not doing what they said they would do. What's that got to do with you? You follow Christ. Now it's worth noting that there are times that other people's failures are our business. And if we're going to be right with God, we've got to confront sin and lovingly be involved in church discipline. But here the Apostle John was not a backslidden believer that Peter was troubled about. He was a rival for a place of prominence. What about him, Lord? Does he have to do everything I've got to do? Jesus bluntly says, that's none of your business. You do what I tell you to do. A singular focus on Jesus. And then lastly, 
This life of submission is marked by a sure faith in Jesus. After identifying himself as the apostle that's been referenced in the little dialogue, our gospel closes in verse 25 with this incredible statement. There are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Now some see this as an inspired exaggeration, maybe a divine hyperbole. I believe, as does D.A. Carson, that it is literally true. That is, if you tried to write down everything that Jesus has ever done, the world itself would not contain the books. And if you think about the one that we've been studying, according to John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without him was not anything made that has been made. That is, Jesus is responsible for everything that happens. If you tried to write a book about something he did one day in your life, the first thing you're going to have to do is start by talking about how he made the trees that that produced the paper and, and, and made the pencil and gave breath in your body. You're going to be talking about an awful lot of stuff before you get down to writing about what you plan to write about. And I believe consistent with John's purpose, he's simply closing the gospel by saying this. If you want to finish well and live a life of service and sacrifice and submission, this walk with Jesus is not a shot in the dark. It's a step into the light. You've got all the evidence you need to realize that this sinless Son of God is worthy of a life that is lived well, And by the grace of God, is finished well. Members of this church have heard me tell the story from a couple of years ago. I was at a place in my life under a lot of pressure. No problems, but just pressure. Listen, the same kind of pressure that you face. Sit very still and listen. The same kind of pressure you face. Raising kids, training my wife. A job. A mortgage, responsibilities at work, responsibilities in the life of the Georgia Baptist. I, at that time, had a very time-consuming role in the community. And I was sharing with a dear friend, a member of this church, about all these pressures. And he said, well, let me give you a couple of words that I use to try to sift out all the things in my life. Everything's got to be able to sift through this little sieve. Here's my goal. He said, I just want, I want to finish well. I do too. And as this book comes to a close, it is a reminder. One day life will come to a close. And I want it to be said that I finished well. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we are grateful for our time in your word. The introspective work of the Holy Spirit has been on obvious display in this service. And I pray that we would indeed yield to you all that we have and all that we are. As the hymn writer said, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. May we give it to you for your glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.